for a lot of pensions, a lot of institutions, our portfolio construction is predicated on this uh, negative correlation between equities and bond. And we've all enjoyed that and, and, and bonds have played a, you know, have had a very specific role in our portfolios in terms of the risk off exposure. And if you get into a case where you really do have sustained inflation and then that, that correlation switches and becomes positive, that creates all types of challenges in terms of how do we build kind of like that risk off bucket. <laughs> When it comes to building a diversified portfolio, understanding where your exposures lie is critical to good performance. But it's not just objective capital allocation that gives you the answers. Risk allocation is just as important, and that's something you need to monitor closely, especially as digital assets become more widely accepted into portfolios and their volatility more widely understood. To better understand this transition, I talked with Catherine Molnar and Andy Spilar, Chief Investment Officers at Fairfax County Police Officers Retirement System and Employee System. So uh, before we get cracking on investing today, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the journey of what investing used to be even like five, 10 years ago. I mean, when I was back in the game, it was fundamental evaluation. That's the way we looked at things now. So is that something, is that the way you used to run the funds uh, back then? And, and how has it really changed over the last five, 10 years? When I first came to Fairfax County, uh, you know, I was along those lines, right? It was all about the stock stories and uh, talking to the equity managers and bottom-up evaluation and listening to those different stories about all the different companies. Um, <clears throat> and I have to tell you that when I had a, a conversation in 2002 with Bob Prince from Bridgewater, that really sort of changed my whole perspective on it and looking at risk allocation as opposed to capital allocation. And uh, you know the the reality was that a lot of those discussions we were having really weren't going to add value at our level where we were managing money. So uh, from that time on, we've worked on shifting the whole perspective of the board um, to risk allocation as opposed to capital allocation. It's a it's a completely different way to think. Can you can you explain that in a bit more detail? What do you mean? What's the difference between risk sure. allocation? Sure. So let's just take a 60/40 portfolio, yeah. right? 60% of your you know portfolio is in 15% vol stocks. Uh, if you have an intermediate ag type uh, portfolio, you've got 40% of your, your money in five vol bonds. Mm. Um, and so you think 60-40 is balanced, but the reality of when you do the math on that is the risk allocation is way in favor of equities. And that's why you'll have like a 90% correlation to equities, right? So, so and, and different drivers impact those two different asset classes or other asset classes like commodities or real estate or whatever you want to add to the mix. Um, and so what you really want is to have equal risk contribution. And this is just, it's a mathematical fact, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it doesn't matter whether it's two stocks or whatever. If you want true diversification and take advantage of whatever the correlation differences between those two assets are, you want equal levels of risk contribution. Mm -hmm. And so that's the way that we design the portfolio. And that's what, so the, that's 60, 40 classic portfolio makeup. That was, how many years ago was that the sort of class interpretation? And then what do you kind of do Yeah, now? well, I mean, in, in some ways it's still, it's still the standard, right? In a lot of places. Um, but uh, in 2003, we started shifting to looking at what is the risk allocation as opposed to what the capital allocation is and how do we want to balance that out? And what it leads you down a path to is, is looking for higher vol assets um, or in using some levels of modest leverage to take a, a low vol asset and leverage it up primarily through the use of futures, mm -hmm. right, as the easiest way to do it, um, uh, to get equal levels of contribution from risk for different types of economic factors. So primarily the growth and inflation are the two main drivers. You can boil it down into all kinds of different risk factors, but uh, ultimately everything really comes down to those two things. So we're looking at how much risk we have in each of our uh, line items. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then adding that up and saying, well, this is how much risk we have in these buckets. What do we want? As opposed to just sort of living with a byproduct. So. And, and just to go, to go even further, I mean, the average institution may have their beautifully colored pie chart, which could have, you know, 47 different Gold, colors. commodities. And it looks like <clears throat> it's really diversified because you have a lot of different pie slices in different colors. But if you kind of look through, you know, peel back the onion and look through, right. you'll see that you have a, you're seriously overweight to a rising growth, you know, growth in economic 
rising economic growth um, exposure. And that could be obviously through um, you know, U.S. equity and European equity and small cap equity and private private equity and credit. Mm -hmm. So there's many different things that you, know, you may look diversified on the surface, but actually, you know, you've got um, you know, as Andy said, maybe 90% exposure directly or indirectly to, to a rising you know economic growth environment, for example. So, so um, can you talk a bit about what's the um, what's the sort of stock selection or asset selection process like at Fairfax from sort of start to finish in terms of where where money's allocated? So, so we have about um, eight to ten different risk buckets, right, that we've identified as the major risk categories. So equities, credit, nominal bonds, inflation bonds, you know, real assets. Uh, real estate? Uh, real real yeah. assets would be real, real, um, real estate as well mm -hmm. as commodities. Mm -hmm. uh, currency risk, uh, gold, precious metals. And so we literally take each line item that we have. So let's just take a high yield manager account. Uh, there's a fair amount of credit risk that's in there, right? And a little bit less, uh, probably about, you know, so let's just say 10 vol on the credit risk, four vol on the interest rate risk, and then you'll have some sort of alpha, right? Uh, from, you know, uh, security selection. And so we'll literally do that evaluation for every single line item and then come up with what the, the portfolio risk totals are in aggregate. And we have a, the way that we've structured the portfolios, we still have a rising growth bias to the portfolio, but we have much more economic sensitivity to rising inflation and falling growth. And so the reality is that, it, that we still participate on the upside, but we don't perhaps capture as much as a 60-40 portfolio, mm -hmm. but we'll protect more on the downside. And so you know, over time, that should give us a little bit of a, a, a volatility advantage, right? right. Our variance drag is just a little less, and we'll compound at a higher rate of return, and that's really what's happened. So our, our systems are top decile plans in terms of the public fund universe, and if you compare them to other corporate or endowments, uh, my guess is we rank up there pretty high as well. Speaking about uh, digital assets in, in particular, um, you guys seem to be uh, one of the first movers in any kind of size into that world. Can you talk a little bit about how that decision came about? In fact, actually, it started here yeah. at the, the FTSE World Investment Forum. It's really funny, just as I think about that, um, about three years ago. So it was in the spring at that time. So in the spring of 2018, um, we were both here, and we were listening to a presentation by a gentleman who's a professor, and it was about digital assets and internet blockchain technology. And we were fascinated, and we weren't really terribly familiar with blockchain or Bitcoin at the time. This is, again, about three and a half years ago. And then literally about a month later, we met a manager, a venture capital manager who was investing in the space. And I think it went a long way that we had just heard this same presentation one month earlier by somebody who was completely independent, completely objective, third party um, professor at that. And so we were really intrigued about the potential growth of this area. And so both of us for each of our respective systems um, proposed an allocation to our respective boards and that was in September of 2018. We decided to enter the space. We were pretty deliberate in that we really wanted to focus on blockchain technology, the infrastructures through a venture capital fund and not try to make a bet on which cryptocurrency may ultimately right. rise to the top, whether it would be Bitcoin or Ethereum or what have you. And I would tell you three years later, we're still not comfortable making that bet as to exactly which right. layer one protocol is gonna ultimately kind of rise to the top. Um, so we're very deliberate. We, uh, we got our exposure through venture capital. We sized it s small in both of our cases. Um, and then one year later, we re-upped, and in my case, I doubled my size. So I went from a 50 basis point target to 1% one year later. Um, and then since then, we've made two additional allocations, still in the venture capital space. In the case of all four funds, they can have anywhere from 20 to 30 percent in liquid cryptocurrency, which is north, which not just extremely volatile. Mm -hmm. But because it sits inside of a quarterly valued structure, we don't have to stomach that kind of day-to-day -day volatility. And then very recently, so just this fall, um, both of our boards have approved um, an allocation to a dedicated long, a dedicated long short cryptocurrency hedge fund. So it's classic long short um, hedge fund type strat trading strategies very similar to fixed income relative value trading strategies. And so they have some directional strategies, but most of the strategies are market neutral, or some directional, some mostly relative value market neutral strategies. And they're doing things like basis trades, they're doing triangular arbitrage, they are doing trust arbitrage. 
so some interesting um, active or alpha strategies inside there. And it benefits from the fact that there is as much volatility in the space as there is. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to being limited partners, which both of our systems are, we were also able to negotiate a multi-year revenue share with this manager. So we see it as kind of a great call option on the future adoption of, of digital assets by institutions broadly. And the manager, because they're not just long only, because they are long and short, and they're very dynamic in managing their beta to crypto, um, they've been able to do really well in months when crypto sold off pretty considerably. So we've been very pleased. It's still, you know, it's very new still for us, this, this relationship in the fund. Um, but we're very pleased so far, and we continue to look at the space, and we are likely to make additional recommendations. We just see it as a, just a huge area of growth, and it's yeah. part of a part of a broader innovation theme that both of our systems have been playing. So, blockchain technology, and then also artificial intelligence, life sciences, and um, we're also looking at cybersecurity at yeah. the moment. We we went through a pretty uh, intensive due diligence process too, right? In terms of bringing the the trustees along in the education process, along with us. So. We typically do travel with trustees and we go to due diligence meetings with them, we bring them along. Uh, in this instance, when we traveled down to meet with the first venture capital manager that we were investing with, um, we brought both board chairmen, both vice chairmen. Uh, I had an elected employee that was uh, a Department of Information Technology database specialist, uh, our executive director as well. So we brought along a lot of people to kind of hear the, the message, not just from us, but from, you know, sort of the, just as we're hearing and learning about it as well. And we went through an extensive legal due diligence process as right. well, which I can tell you was pretty pretty painful for everybody, but I think it was uh, was great in the end, so. Well, that, that's what the, the thing I was going to ask next, which, which is so interesting, because there's so many other pension funds, big, big retirement savings funds who have presumably no allocation at all to digital assets, but you have jumped through those hoops. So it's like, what were the boxes that needed to be ticked so that you could pass through that you could give such a big allocation to that because there must be other people who are now presumably going to be going to be following suit and are they now following whatever procedures you you did? We we, we really um, you know initially uh, positioned it as a growth investment and it, and it still is absolutely a growth right. investment that naturally hasn't but changed. But it sounds like you found a way to somehow hedge out a bit of the volatility as well because well, that must be what holds people back. Yes, I think you're right. And if had we done a long only crypto currency fund, that would have been extremely volatile. And I think I don't know if there would have been appetite for that or not. Although we can come back to that because mm -hmm. I think I think we all should actually be thinking about that. By the way, Ooh. but but we did it nonetheless in a venture capital you know structure. So nobody has to to, to look at the day to day volatility of of cryptocurrency. But but again, just stepping back, you know, our our trustees recognize that. You know, we're trying to get 6.75% return. It used to be seven a quarter, it just got lowered recently. But, you know, and, 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 and beta has done very, very well for so very long that our going forward expected returns, that is to say the, the excess return premium over cash from many risk assets is really moderated, right? Because a lot of that future excess return has now been brought forward. So in terms of our ability to continue to get the needed returns in public markets alone, we think it's going to be, mm. you know, limited. And so we have been moving from from public markets to private markets, and this has been going on for six years. This is not new per se. It was largely in par private credit initially, and then more recently in private equity, which would include the digital assets, the venture capital exposure that is. So uh, long story short, we were, you know, our, our trustees understand that we need to look other places for returns, right? Mm. And so again, you know, it's part of a broader innovation theme where we think that we can get the needed returns from certain asset classes for, to make up for those where we probably aren't going to get what we need to get from you. But now you seem to be in this sort of like, you know, high class problem admittedly where digital assets are making up more and more of your portfolio and Indeed. presumably you don't want to sell them, but then again, you've got to sort of manage to this risk. So what do you, what's your day to day conversations about that? So right now, for both of us, our, um, our digital assets allocations, again, for the hedge fund resides as a hedge fund, but okay. the four venture capital funds all reside within our U.S. small cap equity bucket. So we don't have a private equity bucket per se, but to your point, it absolutely means that I am very much overweight U.S. small cap equity at the moment. Um, so, you know, we could potentially short Russell 2000 futures. I previously had some long exposure to Russell 2000 futures, um, and I took all of that off because of the, my being over committed at this point. Mm -hmm. um, we do think that we'll naturally start to work its way, work itself down uh, to some degree because we are expecting distributions from managers and we've been told that we will be getting distributions hopefully at some point still this year. 
Um, so, but 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 it, importantly, we've also, I, at least in my case, I've asked my board of trustees to have a little bit of patience. So I'd rather not sell the assets, um, and I don't really want to short Russell two thousand futures. I mean, I, mm. I you know I, I could if I needed to, but that's not really kind of it's what not I, the long term solution. It's not really right. what I'd like right. to do. Um, so we've asked for their patience and just to, to understand that, you know, we're going to be a bit overweight for a certain period of time. Um, but again, as we start to get distributions, that problem will start to, to correct itself. I mean, it is interesting, though, because what we've seen, especially in the digital asset space, is that these funds are coming to market. You know, instead of it being every two to three years, it's literally like every... Let's say months. ten to twelve months, yeah. and there's a manager that we're looking at right now that had their final, their their most recent fund had the final close in March, and they're currently in the market with their next fund, wow. and it's going to close in. So you say ten December. months, but actually so that number's getting like, slower. And lower. It's like seven months or mm. you know yeah. nine months, something like that. So. Um, yeah, I mean, it's moving. It feels like it's kind of moving at light speed. So. Th there is there is an aspect to this too. So I, I, you know, we sort of use the word cryptocurrency, right? But the the currency part is really just, I think, a really bad misnomer. We've had this discussion with folks too because it, it just, you know, I guess you know for Bitcoin or whatever, it had to have a place, and that just seemed where it went. Yeah. Um, but you know, the the tokens that are out there that are you know, uh, trading on a lot of these exchanges really represents sort of a private, you know, almost liquid private equity, right? So can you invest so, in uh, private token sales as well? Yes. Okay, yep. and that's what you're actively doing as well? So, so venture capital, which is more right. traditional equity-like, right? Mm -hmm. But then a lot of these deals are, are have you know, clauses in the, that if there is a token that's offered, you, you get to participate in that as well. Um, and so... Like and, an, it's like an equity warrant. Yeah. Right. And our managers actively negotiate the governance right. tokens alongside the private equity investment. So I'm trying to think. And then those an governance tokens go have, have liquidity mm. sooner than the underlying equity. Right. So, um, it so, so there's it really multiple ways to actually. play this, right? right. And, so, and that marketplace is expanding. And so, um, you know, uh, the current portfolio has a lot of venture capital in it, which does have you know, obviously some the, the illiquidity to it. But there's a growing amount of tokens that are that are liquid and tradable right and right? the more the, liquid they are the more attractive they will start to become for other funds you have. right and then we do have some exposure to bitcoin and ethereum and things ah. like that um uh, and you know i think our cost basis on that is like three and a half to five thousand dollars right so we've done really well amazing it's liquid and we're in active discussions with all the managers that we're invested with to sort of you know how are we going to manage this like i said high class problem so. yeah it seems like this story is just really gaining momentum. Is there anything in the back of your mind that thinks, is, th is there any issue that concerns you, that keeps you up at night, that thinks something could come along, whether it's regulation or governments that could, that could bring this down? Like, what are the two, what are the things I that th work? I think the, the, the regulation is a, is a risk, but I think the genie's out of the bottle. And right. I don't know how they put it back in. So are, are things gonna be uh, more regulated? Yes, but it's not gonna go away. And, mm -hmm. and there's just too much, there's too much innovation that's happening behind Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. Bitcoin is what everybody, but you know, DeFi and and all kinds of things that are going on in terms of um, sort of the democratization of finance, like truly, as mm. opposed to just sort of, you know. Do you have a view on central bank uh, digital currencies, whether they, they will be a thing? Can they coexist with the, with the Bitcoins of the world? Uh, oh, I think def definitely, yeah. 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 I mean, for sure. I'm, I'm not an expert on the space, but absolutely, yeah. They, yeah. they will, so. Mm. I mean, the, the way someone explained it to me was, I mean, you think that Bitcoin's this huge thing, but I think it's, market, it's like 200 billion or something. It's just, it's still not huge, right. considering, you know, the, the impact it's having and, and again, challenging an ecosystem. Yeah, and again, that's what everybody's focusing on, right? right. But there's so much More else happening. that's going on. And that's really what um, I think keeps a lot of people, you know, out of the space, because that's the focus. And, right. And um, uh, but behind the scenes, there's a tremendous amount of technology innovation going on, and uh, that's really what we're we're interested in. And I, so. I, I do I, I agree with Andy. I think it's I think cryptocurrency is really confusing because when you hear that term, you think, okay, well then it's it's a currency exposure, right? Or it's digital gold, you know, for example, Bitcoin. And so if you think that you want to own it, then maybe you want to own it as a real asset, or maybe you want to own it as a global macro asset if you think it's a currency bet. Mm. But to Andy's point, this is just all technology. This, every single thing that we've talked about, 
should be classified in your technology like equity bucket, right? These are all new technologies and some of them are, are private and the tokens though have more liquidity, the tokens are not as private and they have liquidity sooner than the private equity itself. Um, but these are all just technologies and, and, and you should want to, we should all want to own the tokens of the technologies that have the most promise, right? If it's a decentralized finance application, the ones that are gonna have like the broadest adoption, right? So. You know, you don't want to, or we don't want our managers to own tokens just for the sake of running tokens. If the actual technology that underlies those tokens is 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 not, yeah. you know, not interesting and not needed by you know by anyone. So, yeah. um, but these are they're technology investments, and um, but I think people get hung up on that for sure. And then, you know, people don't know where to put it in their portfolio. Mm. Um, and you know, I think you know, I know there's some pensions recently that have made allocations to Bitcoin and Ethereum, which is, it's great in the sense that you're gaining exposure to the space, but that's really scratching the surface. Those mm -hmm. are like the two most basic layer one protocols and it actually only gets more interesting from there in terms of the other protocols that have more functionality and then all the applications that are being built on top of these other ones. So Bitcoin is extremely basic. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's elegant in the sense that it's never been hacked and that it works, so mm. it's like the proof of concept for blockchain technology itself. Right. But its actual like functionality is extremely limited versus some of these other ones. Right. So. Uh, and something like a Solana or an Ave or mm. you know a lot of these different Polkadot. other things Polkadot. have no, nothing nothing really to do with either currencies or central banks digitizing their own currencies. And mm. so um, you know I think I think the word like I said currency is just a real misnomer and it right. leads we're people. really talking about the technology behind it yes yeah. what kind of conversations or what are your thoughts in and around inflation right now does it is it affecting some of the decisions you're making um it has so we've we've both added some inflation extra inflation protection since mm -hmm. march of 2020 and um I, I i won't speak for andy but i am definitely in the camp that we will have inflation and it's not going to be transitory right for a variety of different reasons but yeah i mean i think we Inflation is, is, is here. I was, I was about to say it's coming, but it's here, and I think it's here to stay for a while. And um, and so we've both added gold and some other assets in the last year and a half to try to position. Makes me happy. I'm very long gold myself. Yeah. Uh, so we, had, we added uh, you know gold overlays using futures. Yeah. Um, but just in general, because of the risk framework that we have, right. we've we've had commodity futures for a while. Right. It was painful, you know, for a while. And bonds are going well, right? But that, that's kind of the point. Yeah. And so when you get a month like in January of this year, uh, where you had a lot of inflation buzz, right? Uh, rates moved up uh, and our commodity, I made more money in commodities than I lost in bonds. Right. That's, that's the portfolio construction that's the nature methodology of the game. and that's what we're trying to do. Right. And we have a lot more sort of protection in that regard than most. So we've mm -hmm. made some additions on the margin, but we haven't really had to maneuver the portfolio in a significant way. We've been asking people to look out five years, have a sort of five year horizon. What do you think would be the main topics that we as investors will be, will be talking about then? I mean, I guess obviously the world of digital assets will be a big topic, but I mean, AI presumably will be another uh, a factor in, in, uh, in the workplace. Um, so just over to you what you thought some of the bigger issues would be in five years time. Um, so I'll make a couple of points, which I know you've heard me make to other people recently, but one of them is, is longevity. So, um, you know, I was at a, I've told the story, but I was at a conference about four years ago, and there was a, a, a person who spoke who was a futurist, which kind of almost sounds like wow. science fiction, but they're just okay. talking about technologies and okay. medical advances and that type of thing. <laughs> and because this is four years ago, and because of all of the, because of the speed of medical advances, they basically said anybody in the room who's 50 or younger should expect that they're going to live to be 125 years old. Wow. And for us as p public pension yeah. you know, <laughs> officials who, you know, have, we have like, a defined benefit so and a guarantee, like, you know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like I've almost fell out of my chair. Right. Um, so, you We're know, it's all going to work longer, right? Yes. Right. I mean, so, I mean, just, and then all the ramifications of social security and healthcare and, but, you know, so, so one, that would be one thing, just longevity. And then, um, switching topics, but if we really do get inflation that is here to stay, um, then I have concerns about, this is not just specifically in the next five years, but concerns about from a portfolio construction standpoint, mm -hmm. you know, if we lose the, you know, many of our, many of our, a lot of, for a lot of pensions, a lot of institutions, our portfolio construction is predicated on this uh, negative correlation between equities and bonds, right? And we've all enjoyed that and, and, and bonds have played a, you know, have had a very specific role in our portfolios, right? In terms of the risk off exposure. 
And if you get into a case where you really do have sustained inflation, and then that, that correlation switches and becomes positive, um, then that's, you know, that, that creates all types of challenges in terms of how do we build kind of like that risk off bucket, right? So, and I would tell you it's already a challenge because with rates being as low as they are, it's already pretty hard to build that risk off bucket, right? But course, yeah. if we start to see a positive correlation between equities and rates, um, that's going to get even more challenging. So. I mean, I think the ESG right. issues are not going to go away. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I, I also think we're also in a boom for innovation, and that's why we've sort of tried to focus in on it over the last couple of years, um, and we're re really focusing on artificial intelligence, yep. blockchain technology, uh, defense and cybersecurity. Mm. So, um, you know, wars of the future are not going to be played out on battlefields, right? Um, and so we really want to try and focus in on that as well. And then right. life sciences. So as you say, biotech. Different. Yep. All these mega trends happening at once. Well, exciting time to be alive. I think we all <laughs> agree. But uh, Andy, Catherine, thank you so much for your time. It's been really great chatting sure. with you. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Trying to predict markets is nothing short of Sisyphean. It's as futile as trying to predict the future. But luckily, that's not the goal of an investor. The goal of investing is to make the best asset selection based on the available information and the risk reward profile you are presented with and do that consistently. We don't know what the future holds, but by keeping up with what the experts are saying about the future of investing, well, that does give you edge. If you'd like to read more on the topic, please go to footsierussell.com forward slash research for more information.